Welcome to the CLL Society's Deep Dive into Five webcast and podcast. I'm Terry Evans, longtime CLL patient advocate and a 22-year CLL survivor. I'm also the director of the CLL Society Support Network. I'm your host for this new webcast podcast event. Joining me today for this session, your questions on planning your therapy moves, is Dr. Susan O'Brien, professor of medicine at University of California at Irvine and a member of the CLO Society's board of directors. She has been deeply invested in solving the challenges of today concerning chronic lymphocytic leukemia and was just named one of the top 40 female scientists in the world. We are very lucky to have her here to help answer your biggest questions on this topic. Welcome, Dr. O'Brien. Thank you, Terry. Great to be here. All right, Dr. O'Brien, we have five questions for you, and we're going to try to answer these in 15 minutes. Are you ready to go? Yep. Okay, let's tackle the first question. Dr. O'Brien, this one is very common in a lot of support groups. When do I term, determine if I need to begin treatment and move out of watch and wait? I think a, a pretty simple but useful way to look at that is um, – Basically, when the disease is causing significant problems, if the disease is not causing any problems, then there's no reason to do anything about it. Now, those problems can be different in different people. So, for example, in some people, it could be very bulky lymph nodes or a very enlarged spleen that's causing the problem. In other people, they may not have much in the way of enlarged lymph nodes, but they may have very problematic uh, blood counts, a high white count, or they're beginning to develop anemia low platelet counts, et cetera. So the indications for treatment can be very variable, completely different between two people, but basically when the disease is causing a problem. Okay, thank you, Dr. O'Brien. Are there any considerations for starting treatment earlier with the better therapies that are coming out there? And the second part of that, are there any differences in, to start treatment if you are relapsed refractory as opposed to first line? So that's a great question. I think many patients want to know, is watch and wait really the best strategy? Uh, probably in the days when chemotherapy was our only option, uh, uh, it was more reasonable to delay chemotherapy because of all the toxicities. But now we have the small molecules that are given orally or highly effective, et cetera. On the other hand, we don't just want to make the assumption that earlier treatment is good. There actually are two randomized trials, and one of them is, done, is being done in Germany, so I won't talk about that, but one is being done across the United States, all over the U.S. right now, and that started out as a SWOG trial, that's a cooperative group trial, and has now become an intergroup trial, so as I said, is open in many sites across the whole U.S. Now, is anybody eligible for this? No, because what this trial wants to do is look at high-risk people, and there are various ways high risk is defined, including looking at chromosomes, the mutation status. And why high risk? Because we know that these are the people who are not going to go 20 years without therapy. Um, so it's more reasonable to ask if early intervention benefits the high risk who have the most to, to gain, if you will. People also have to be within one year uh, of diagnosis to be eligible for this trial. But I would discuss this with my physician. If you do have high-risk characteristics, including, let's say, a 17P deletion, even if you are asymptomatic and don't have any need for therapy. And in that trial, patients will be randomized, so like the flip of a coin, um, to either get an early intervention with targeted therapy or to continue watch and wait until they need therapy. The other really nice thing about that trial is all the drugs whether you get treated initially or later on after watch and wait, are completely free uh, if you're partaking in this trial. So a really great trial answering a really important question um, and also providing the advantage of free drugs. So the second part of that was, is there any difference uh, as to when to start if you're relapse refractory as opposed to frontline? No, we still take the same approach. So particularly if we're following a patient closely who's been in remission, well, what? let's say the first sign of the disease coming back is that the lymphocyte count, which had been normal, 
is now 8,000. Well, the high likelihood is that patient has no symptoms whatsoever. And so just like up front, why, why would we treat such minimal disease? So in general, we do take the same approach in the relapse situation of watching and waiting until the disease is causing a problem. Okay, on to question number two. If my disease recurs after treatment of venetoclax plus obinutuzumab, and I re have reached UMRD, is it possible to retreat with that combination of drugs again? So absolutely it is. Remember that venetoclax and obinutuzumab is what we call a time-limited therapy, meaning it's given for one year and then stopped. And many patients do achieve undetectable MRD, but even those that don't usually still achieve very good remissions. And so what happens after that is that the likelihood, particularly if the person is UMRD, meaning undetectable MRD, is that their remission is going to last for years. And the other important point is that when the disease recurs, it's not recurring on the therapy. So we would expect that those cells that come back years later may still be sensitive to the same treatment as given originally. Now, there is limited data with retreatment. Um, and so we know that we can retreat. What we don't have much data on at this point is what's the durability of the second remission in comparison to the first. But we absolutely do know that patients can be retreated and do respond. And with longer follow-up, we'll have more data on the durability of those second remissions. Speaking of retreatment, for somebody who's on a, been on a BTK inhibitor and their disease recurs from a frontline setting, what would you suggest to them as a second line treatment? Right, and you're bringing up a great point, Terry, that unlike with a fixed duration therapy, uh, patients who progress on a BTK inhibitor are showing relapse disease on the therapy. So clearly what's happened is the disease that's coming back is resistant to that drug or it wouldn't be coming back. And we know that if you are resistant to one of the currently available BTK inhibitors, you're generally resistant to all of them. So that means that we really cannot use for right now that class of drugs anymore. So right now, the best thing to do would be to switch to a venetoclax-based regimen, either venetoclax and obinutuzumab or venetoclax and rituximab. And we know that venetoclax works very well in the setting where people become resistant to the current BTK inhibitors. Now, there are investigational drugs, and there are some clinical trials that may be relevant to our patients, looking at a different type of BTK inhibitor called a non-covalent inhibitor. And the advantage of these inhibitors is that they do work in the setting where our current BTK inhibitors uh, are stop working. So those drugs may be another potential option in addition to venetoclax-based therapy, uh, but are not yet FDA approved, but can, uh, there are some clinical trials ongoing with those drugs. And if people are that interested makes... in knowing the names, sorry, one of them is pertabrutinib and one of them is nemtabrutinib. Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you for that. The next question is, after achieving remission, what is the likelihood that my CLL will come back more aggressively? And is it typical that it comes back stronger or more resistant to treatment? It's a great question. Historically, when we only had chemotherapy or chemoimmunotherapy, meaning chemotherapy with rituximab, um, in general, when the disease came back, uh, it didn't mean that it wouldn't re-respond to further chemoimmunotherapy, but generally the responses were not as good as in the frontline setting, and the remissions um, are short, were shorter. So we know that for chemotherapy-based treatment. What's a little unclear is what's the story for small molecule treatment? Because as we just talked about with venetoclax and obinutuzumab, there's very little data on relapse because those remissions are lasting so long. So we don't really have data on the durability of the remission. As I mentioned, we know that we can retreat and get responses. It's possible that the remissions may not be as long the second time around. Because the, the venetoclax obinutuzumab regimen is so new, we don't have uh, you know, five to 10 year follow up, that, that's making it hard right now to give a, a really good answer to that question. Um, but again, I would, I would um, divide up 
response and durability of response by saying we know we can get responses again with venetoclax-based therapy. What we don't know is how long will the second remission last compared to how long the first remission lasts. And again, that data will emerge with time. We just don't have it yet. Right. Thank you for that response. Okay, this is one of the two-parter questions that we have. It's when should I seek out a CLL specialist to be part of my team, and how would I go about finding one? So uh, I may have a bias here, but I think that everybody should um, get the opinion of a CLL expert. It doesn't necessarily mean that you um, cannot stay with a doctor that you like. Uh, so let's say a patient has had CLL and they've been with a doctor for a year and they have a good relationship with them. What I would say is when that when the, there's going to be a change to the plan. So let's say now that doctor says, um, I think for whatever the reason, we need to initiate treatment. That's where I think you probably want to get an, a, an expert opinion to find out a couple of things. Number one, th does the expert agree that you, you do need treatment now? That would be the first uh, most obvious question. Um, and then secondly, if they do agree, are they in agreement with the treatment proposal that that physician is proposing? Or do they have more information being a specialist that would lead them to suggest an alternate therapy? And then finally, what clinical trials are, might be available, particularly locally, if you go to a local expert uh, that you could participate in that might offer you uh, uh, free drugs on the clinical trial or might offer you drugs that are not yet FDA approved, but look very promising and you'd like to be uh, treated with those agents. So I think it's really when there's a, a decision to be made. Some people like to see an expert right off the bat, which I also think is very good, um, particularly because experts, I think, are, are generally um, perhaps more attuned to going over the natural history of CLL, what to expect, what not to expect, et cetera, um, because the experts are treating CLL all, all the time. So I think at, by clearly if there's a major decision to be made, I would not want to be doing anything without getting an expert opinion. As to how you can find them, um, here's where, if you're already on this webinar, you may already know this, that CLL Society is really very helpful and has a lot of resources, not only for finding experts in the area, but also for identifying clinical trials. So it's a great resource um, specifically for that, amongst other things. That's great to know. Adding on to that question, what are the what's the information that I should share when I'm thinking for my first treatment uh, with my doctor? Or, I mean, what are the considerations that, as a patient, you think I should be asking you in terms of the treatments available? Well, certainly, uh, it depends on you know how important certain things are to you. Um, one is how well does this treatment work? Obviously, everyone wants to know that. But also a very important question is what are the side effects? Because different drugs have different side effects and it's a trade-off. So for example, um, with the BTK inhibitors, if you have a very, uh, a very strong medical history of cardiac issues, those are probably drugs that you want to avoid. So knowing what we call your comorbidities or what the other issues that you have are and discussing them with the doctor is important. The side effects, lots of people say, oh, I like the idea of fixed duration therapy, and who wouldn't? On the other hand, what I say to my patients, if I think a continuous therapy is better for them, well, think about it. Are you on blood pressure medication? Are you on statins for your lipids? Or, it turns out that most people in, in the age of, of 60s and 70s, which is the age of CLL or, or 80s, you know what, they're on meds that they take every day and that are not really a problem for them. So I don't necessarily think that you need the patient to go in thinking, oh, well, it's going to be better to have a short duration therapy. That absolutely may not be the case. The other thing that needs to come up in the discussion is wh what are your goals? Do you want to stay in remission as long as possible? Would you rather have a drug that you're not sure it'll cause as long a remission, but it has very little in the way of side effects? So what goals are important uh, to the person themselves? Um, and, and, you know, in terms of the other discussion point is prognostic factors. I don't think anybody should be discussing treatment with their physician if they don't know their prognostic factors, because that absolutely 
makes an, a, a, an impact, at least if I'm advising someone, on what therapy I would advise. So certainly important things like chromosome analysis, do you have a 17P deletion, immunoglobulin mutation status. As an expert, that would completely um, might change what I would recommend to my treatment, for, to my patient, all things being equal. So just to kind of summarize, what, what's important to you, the patient? Are you more interested in, in the durability of your remission or you are more worried or challenged by side effects? What are your comorbidities that might be relevant to the side effects of the drug? And what are the prognostic factors that could help determine which treatment would be best for you? Yeah, the CL Society is uh, taking great pains to educate patients on tests before treat. And that's important not only in your first line therapy, but also in subsequent therapies as well. Absolutely. All right. Last question, Dr. O'Brien. What are some of the newest trial results and research that you're excited about? And is there anything in particular about combination therapies or sequencing that I should know? There's also some preliminary ASH papers that have come out and anything new in those? Uh, yes. So, um, one of the things that's very exciting I already mentioned, which are what we call the non-covalent BTK inhibitors, because as I mentioned, those drugs can work in the setting where all of the currently available drugs, so we have ibrutinib, acalabrutinib, xanabrutinib is not yet approved for CLL, but it will be soon. However, it is FDA approved for lymphoma, so it, it, it can be prescribed. All three of those drugs, generally, if, if you are developing resistant disease on one, the other one is not going to work. But with these new non-covalent inhibitors, uh, they will work in that setting. So that gives you more options if the disease is coming back on the current inhibitors. Um, the CAR-Ts are still um, providing some really interesting data uh, in CLL. We don't have a CAR-T that's FDA approved, but there are a number of clinical trials. Interestingly, some of them combining the CAR-T with ibrutinib, but not because we expect people to respond to the ibrutinib since many people who go on to the CAR-T are resistant to ibrutinib, but rather because it seems to make the T cells more effective. So that's an interesting approach uh, to making CAR-Ts better in CLL. Um, you mentioned the combinations, uh, Terry. Yes, we combination small molecules. So, so far, most of the data we have is ibrutinib and venetoclax, plus or minus obinutuzumab. Some of the trials have antibodies, some don't. Um, some of the trials are using acalabrutinib rather than ibrutinib, and some are using xanabrutinib. The venetoclax is the common denominator because in that group of drugs, that's the only drug. So venetoclax is a BCL2 inhibitor, and that is the only commercially available BCL2 inhibitor at the, com at the current moment. So those combination trials are very exciting because they're producing high rates of undetectable MRD, allowing then for the potential for fixed duration therapy, people staying in remission for years, and then as we've already discussed, at the time of recurrence, being able to go back to those therapies. So that's very exciting. I want to just say we've covered a lot of ground in this short period of time, and unfortunately, we are out of time now. But Dr. O'Brien, I want to thank you for taking time to speak with me and share your expertise with CLL and the most up-to-date information on therapy to help inform patients and healthcare providers as well as they think through therapy sequencing. This was a fun way to get important information out to the audience. Thank you so much. Happy to participate. Thank you for inviting me. In closing, we'd like to thank Beijing, Bristol-Myers Squibb, Janssen, Loxo at Lilly, Genentech for making this podcast webcast possible through their support. If you are interested in learning more about CLL or SLL, please contact and visit the CLL Society website and check out the free educational programming and physician-curated articles composed of the, for the patient audience. The CLL Society is dedicated to delivering the best credible and up-to-date information for the CLL-SLL community. We work to help educate and empower patients and caregivers, and our motto is smart patients get smart care. Lastly, I want to thank you, our audience, for joining us on this webcast podcast, and I hope you have learned something new that can help inform your decision-making and improve your care. Until next time, 
stay strong, and we are all in this together.